thank you. Um, yes. so what's up? What's happening? I have no idea what we're going to talk about. Like, I, I just literally don't know. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I saw that yesterday you won a cooking competition. Is that, uh, is that what's next? Uh, no, I, I will not be, I will not be, uh, uh taking my talents to, to the cooking sector. I thought personally that I watch because I watch hours and hours and hours of MasterChef. I thought that it was going to be super easy and that I was going to be able to bake, uh, bake something uh, with ease. And I was wrong, completely wrong. So that's not, that's not in the, in the, in my future, but I did win yesterday. Yes. I did win in a cake baking competition. Well, congrats on that. We were very excited for you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I figured, um, uh, want to talk to you a bit about like new media versus old media. Okay. Uh, perfect. and, and I was enjoying, uh, I was enjoying listening to your show the other day and it occurred to me, like, what do you think the sort of the legacy media outlets, you know, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, infinitely superior Rolling Stone. Like, what's one story that you think they have exactly backwards, and how would you like them to fix that? That's a great question. Um, with respect to how legacy media operates and how independent media operates, I would say, like, I can't speak on specific stories, but what I can say is that legacy media severely lacks uh the the human component like the the personality component uh it's too manufactured it's too manicured and i do think that that um uh that plays a role in legacy media not being as um appealing to the younger demographic um on top of that though if we're going to uh, talk about like individual stories i think uh a, a uh, coverage of uh, palestinian rights uh steven donzinger donzinger who uh, was recently um, allowed to uh, to leave uh, the house arrest that he was subjected to by civil court for successfully uh, su successfully uh, uh, defeating uh, Exxon. I think it was Exxon. I always mix, miss it up, Exxon or Chevron. Um, but um, that that I, rarely got coverage in in legacy uh, in legacy media. It was Chevron. I, I said Exxon, but it was Chevron. And um, things that honestly. Uh, routinely uh, go against the the established uh, the established order, like things that criticize capital, uh, you know, labor rights, um, you know, the momentum, the labor union momentum that we're seeing all around the country. I feel like that doesn't get a lot of press coverage. It's changing right now, but I do believe that legacy media, for the most part, is like uh, trailing behind. What do you think? Um like as you look at lady legacy media, what do you see and think like, okay, that though, that piece of that I can I can take from that, I can build on that. Like there's there's some virtue there. What do you see as some of the upsides of it? What are the upsides of legacy media? Um, journalism. You, like being able to do having like, having you know, the funds. Help. Having the funds to be able to send people uh all around the world and and actually doing like, you know, actually doing the news, actually doing journalism. Because like I'm an idiot, uh, and I am. I'm very honest, but uh, I am very limited in what I can do as far as uh, as far as like actually being able to to uh, like break news. Right? I can't scoop anyone. I'm only one person. I'm a one person operation. I can do commentary, but I'm not actually you know uh, reporting on anything. I'm not ever reporting on anything new. And that is still something that is incredibly important. And that is what uh, I would say uh, legacy publishers uh, do best. As um, when you've been, when you've been doing your show, are there moments where you're like, okay, like I'm, I'm giving this commentary. Where can I go deeper? Like, where can I find out more? Because you have this voice and you have this big audience. Uh, and I, I just wonder, like, within the commentary, you know, is there room? Is there room to grow? Is there room for more interviews? Um, certainly. I mean, there's plenty more that I can do, um, but I, I again, I'm limited by being one person, and I'm also limited by um, 
because I'm limited by time constraints as well. You know what I mean? I'm like preparing for, for whatever kind of news coverage I'm going to do for the day. And there's only so, uh, so many hours in the day for me to be able to do that. And then also live stream for eight to 10 hours a day, which is what I do. Um, so that there is definitely things that I could do uh, more of like uh, some interviews and, and whatnot. But um, I mean, I try, I try to set up like a cool and, and unique and interesting interviews, but I, like I said, I don't have a booker or anything. So uh, it's you know that like a, it was a 15 minute video the other day. Um, uh, I like that. I thought that was sharp. Uh, and I like that format. It felt like you sort of drilled down, concentrated a bit. Oh, All you're right, talking about you're talking about the the uh, your whiteness does not exist. The video yeah. on my on my YouTube, I think, or no, what was it? White people do not exist. Yeah. So that's what I used to do when I was at the Young Turks um, before I started on Twitch and before I went on my own. Um, I used to I used to uh, I created a show called The Breakdown on the Young Turks where I scripted out my commentary ahead of time. I was also really bad off the cuff on camera. Part of the reason why I actually joined Twitch to begin with was so that I could get better at speaking off the cuff and speaking my mind. Um, I was a decent writer. Um, so but I would script out everything and I would do a lot of research ahead of time and like script it basically ahead of time and then read it from a teleprompter. And um so uh, that was what was uh, the, the white people do not exist uh, video was not scripted. It was off the cuff. I was just responding to a chatter, but I think it, it came across similar to like my older, uh, older videos. When you started doing Twitch, was there a moment where you're like, okay, this could be the thing. Like this is, this is going to take me places. Never to the degree of success that I experienced uh, on the platform. I think that was shocking for me and shocking for everyone else, uh, if I'm being honest. I, I thought that it was going to be a place where I could, like I was looking for a place where I could have my own community. I did not want to be under the umbrella of the Young Turks. I wanted my own properties. I wanted uh, to, to you know, exercise uh, my own creativity uh, without any sort of constraints from a larger company. Um, and and I always wanted to uh, be able to have like a little community on Twitch uh, for myself uh, with like minded individuals. But like it blew up way past what I ever would have imagined. Do you um, I was thinking about this earlier. I was watching your stream and I was realizing, wow, like eight hours a day. Do you ever get anxious about being wrong? Like, do you ever think like, oh, shit, I'm going to look back on that and be like, oh, that one hurt. Yeah, no, all the time. And I do get things wrong uh, sometimes. I mean, it's normal. Uh, a lot of people get things wrong. It's just, it's only human, um, especially when I'm covering news for eight hours a day. Uh, one of the most famous uh, examples of this is when um, my analysis was correct, but my prediction was wrong when I thought that Russia would not be stupid enough to actually invade Ukraine. And I was pretty adamant about not listening to the State Department on that issue, given all of the prior examples of the State Department straight up lying about things. Um, and and that uh, I, I mean I wasn't alone in that assessment. The reason, the main reason why I did not want to believe the State Department personally was because I was listening to Ukrainian authorities on the matter, and they themselves also did not think that Russia was going to invade Ukraine um, until they did. Um, and that was that was a big you know that was a big deal for a lot of people on the internet who was like who were very upset with the way I uh, mistreated them. I guess leading up to that moment. Um, there was also a little bit more, uh, you know, anxiety and anger considering that it's like, uh, you're, you're taking a position where like, uh, America is not immediately the villain in the story. And it seems like you're making America to be the villain in the story. Any kind of anti-imperialist rhetoric is going to be met with a lot of uh, anger and frustration from even leftist and progressive audiences because American exceptionalism and, and American foreign policy is just the, is just the norm. It's the hegemonic attitude and we're all living in the imperial core. So people were very frustrated with that. But I, you know, I, I immediately admitted even before uh, other sources were calling it an Im invasion that I was wrong and that Russia was invading Ukraine. And, um, you know, while that probably impacts, uh, while that probably affects like the way some people see my coverage, and I'm sure it has, um, ultimately, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like, sometimes I'm going to get stuff wrong. But I'm always going to be honest with you. I'm always going to tell you what my biases are, personally. I'm not going to hide that, and I never have. Um, and I'm going to tell you if I'm wrong. I will correct myself. When, when people come to your show for the first time, um, what do you hope that they get out of it? And what do you hope that, like, 
you know, if they come back like a week, a month later, like how do you hope that changes their news consumption experience? How how do I hope like people's news consumption experiences changes when I get something wrong? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm saying when people come to your show for the first time, mm -hmm. like what do you hope that they get out of it? Uh, and then if they stay for a month, like wh what do you hope you've helped them understand in a way that they oh. might not have? Um, I believe I have uh, a position that is not necessarily discussed openly in uh in in many circles including even like you know college uh, and and certainly not in media uh but it is actually widely shared by people they just have never communicated their desires from an ideological perspective what i mean by that is uh, that i i am uh, a a leftist i am a uh, i believe in socialism i believe in uh a, a i believe in a different way of organizing the economy and I think that a lot of people, if you were to uh, talk to a lot of people about the actual realities of, of like uh, Marxism or a Marxist or a socialist organization of the economy, they are going to be way more susceptible to agreeing with you as long as you don't use those words, which I rarely ever do. I don't ever I don't normally say like I'm a socialist. I rarely ever come out and say it. Uh, um, uh, I rarely say anything beyond I'm a leftist. And the reason for that is because of centuries of Red Scare propaganda and the, the demonstrable failure of like prior socialist, uh, or not socialist, but like at least uh, uh, countries that have tried to, uh, to counter uh, the, the capitalist hegemonic uh, organization have, have lost. They've demonstrably failed. And uh, because of that, it's impossible to come out and be like, I'm a socialist. You know what I mean? You're socialist. That's like a. There's like a big. That's a broad swath of ideology that can fit in that. I mean, that's everything from like, you know, Denmark to Venezuela or the Soviet Union. No, I don't Do think. You, I don't think Denmark is socialist. I think Denmark is a. Or I think European Nordic social democracies are still capitalist. They will recognize that they're capitalist. They're social democracies. Um, even, even Venezuela itself. Or, uh, or all these other countries have like attempted to transition into socialism. China claims that it's uh, currently in a transitional state uh, of socialism, but um, I mean, they're the just, at the moment. Uh, like, if you if you look at the sweep of China, it is it is fifty years of telling you that they're transitioning towards socialism while simultaneously liberating the market and funneling money upward. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say they're funneling money upwards, but uh, I think that their infrastructure, their infrastructure expenditure is, is pretty solid. I mean, they've been able to urbanize pretty effectively. Um, I think that is a, that is a socialization. There's an aspect of socialization similar to, or rather not dissimilar to Nordic style social democracies. Um, but of course, they're not like, you know, still, there's still private ownership. And it's not like uh, China is famous for it's like, uh, you know, worker organized uh, worker councils or their uh, worker organized like uh, uh, governance. It's not the case. But they do do some cool stuff with billionaires every now and then when they make them not billionaires. Yeah, I was uh, I was listening to your str uh, your take on uh, baby food poisoning and how China handled it when they had the melamine in the milk versus sort of the current approach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think like America loves executing uh, mentally ill black people in places like Texas and Florida. They love it. They literally get off on it. It, it must be a kink or something because there's no reason for it. Um, you know, instead of that, maybe we should actually, uh, if we're going to have capital punishment, why not use it on people in actual positions of power? So this is a, a question I had about you because one thing I've noticed um, is like you, you lay it on the line. You don't mince words. Uh, but sometimes I think one thing that's hard for people who don't watch a lot of Twitch or have never been in like the World of Warcraft general chat is they struggle to gauge like what's like what's a bit, what's literal, what's like a, a like a figurative thing. Like if they if they were to come down and figure out that someone through negligence had killed infants via uh, you know poison baby formula, capital punishment? No, I'm anti capital punishment. I'm joking. Um, no, the the. Uh, no, of course not. Obviously, I don't. I'm not a believer in capital punishment. I when when the subject matter comes up and I'm talking about it seriously, you'll know what my position is. And I am, of course, anti-capital punishment. I think it's gross. It's it's disgusting. 
and I do think that uh, America is is trailing behind the rest of the world. Surprise, surprise. I think our entire carceral system is just absolutely awful and and dehumanizing. There's a reason why Norway considers it to be a human rights uh, abuse to, uh, to to send prisoners to America, and they refuse to do so um, because it is it is uh, horribly dehumanizing. Uh, it's one of the uh, worst and and one of the most like unchangeable aspects of American society. Uh, it, it's our it's our draconian attitude uh, of, that revolve around crime and punishment. Like we think that we have to, you know, we think that the state should execute people and and that our our criminal justice system slants towards vengeance rather than actual justice. Okay, if you were you know gifted magic powers, um. What do you think, like, the first, like, three steps would be towards fixing that? Three steps towards fixing our, our um, like, our, our prison system? Yeah, I mean... Um, yeah. I mean, that's an incredibly, like in that's an incredibly complicated uh, structure, but I would, I would try to tackle crime uh, as it manifests, as in uh, uh, I would try to solve the underlying uh, material inequalities that is at least historically and in contemporary society, why violent crime occurs. Um, and you can't do that without, you know, you can't actually solve crime without solving the, the, uh, the underlying material reasons for why violent crime manifests. Um, so I would try to work on that, the, the inequality uh, in, in underserved neighborhoods. Um, I, and I mean, beyond that, I don't know. I would try to, with my magic wand, change the attitude that Americans have, uh, that where they believe that uh, they they have a vindictive approach. Uh, I would try to get them to believe in rehabilitation over incarceration. Um, so stepping stepping out of the realm of of magic wands, that's probably a dumb frame. But say it's like twenty one hundred, and things in America have worked out well. Why well, do you if we're think talking that... about tangible legislation, I can actually give yeah. you a, a way better answer on that. One of the main things that uh, we need to immediately do is see prisoners as human beings rather than the dehumanized attitude that we have for the incarcerated. Uh, prisoners' rights is a, is a big uh, a big way to do that. Uh, prisoners should be able to vote, for example. That's number one. Uh, if they're able to vote, they're now a constituency. They're now um, able to be heard. Um, and I think that uh, there, that would go a long way in basically starting the conversation around solving some of the issues immediately at hand and the way that prisoners is the, the unjustifiable conditions that prisoners are subjected to in this country. Um, so that's definitely one uh, area that I would uh, focus on legis legislation wise. One thing that's hard for me, because when I started in politics, I was covering climate um, and that was that was 14 years ago. And at the time, people said, like, OK, this is it. This is our last chance. We got to do something about climate, and if we don't, we're in trouble. And of course, we didn't do anything. Good thing we solved it. Yep. <laughs> it's my uh, it's my favorite Onion headline ever. Is whatever happened to climate change? Uh, and then you know now we're back there. It's it's twelve years. Twenty twenty was twelve years after like our last climate push. We're not going to do it again. It's pretty clear, barring some miracle like the big climate package is dead. Mm -hmm. How do you do you stay hopeful? And if so, how? Do I stay hopeful? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I wouldn't like, say I'm a very you, hopeful person. The world is so different from the one that we're living in, and and you know that's obviously like a big focus. Do you ever see in your lifetime us getting there, getting close to there? Uh, a solution to climate change, more no. broadly, like a, a world that aligns more closely with with the kind of things you talk about in your show. I was wanting to see. Hey, who knows? You know, there are there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. Right. I can't speak on that. I, I personally do not know. I can only contribute to that as best as I can by urging others to organize their workplaces and and, you know, uh, mobilize politically in every way they can, no matter how marginal or fractional it feels. I think that that is something that I push for and that we should continue pushing for because there's nothing else you can do. You can only try to work and build the foundations of a better tomorrow for future generations because uh, this kind of change, especially when you're going up against like centuries of, of uh, solidified capitalist dogma, it's going to be really difficult. It's going to, in many instances, it's going to feel 
like uh, your change is is not happening. It's not going to even feel like it's gradually happening. Um, but uh, you know, you just keep going. If you if you believe in justice, you just have to keep going, no matter what. My um my mom was in Washington last last week, two weeks ago, whenever um whenever the decision came down, and we happened to be walking by the Supreme Court, uh, and she noticed people who were about her age. Uh, sorry, mom, when Roe uh, passed. And she had this moment where she was like, this 50 years, this this 50 year struggle, and it looks like we're going to turn back. Um, but then she got to talking with some of them. And she realized that on the other side, that also means that after 50 years, there are still people in it. And there's still people who haven't given up on that fight. And that was a that was like a poignant moment for me when I was getting a little mopey about climate change and, and things that I care about, um, including uh, reproductive rights. Yeah, I mean, I think that hyper focusing on wedge issues such as uh, abortion rights, when it is basically established that seventy percent of the country has since the uh, since the decision on Roe v. Wade, um, virtually an agreement. Like, there's a super majority agreement on this issue. The only reason why it's something that people are talking about is because it's a wedge issue that the Republican Party utilizes to mobilize a very active voter base of evangelicals. Right? This and like school segregation pro-segregation for schools, of course, is the two key, uh, is, is like the two political things that have historically mobilized evangelicals. Um, the only reason why we ever, in my opinion, discuss this as a back and forth and not like established uh, uh, law of the land uh, is, is because uh, the Democratic Party is feckless and inept and is unable to actually offer a progressive agenda that they run on oftentimes so that the Republicans can react to that progressive agenda. Um, so Republicans look for different ways of, of making themselves seem different than the Democratic Party when on a lot of issues, they are perfectly aligned. Uh, oftentimes deregulation, maybe the Democrats are at a slower pace when it comes to deregulation or play the defensive role against deregulation, but the Republicans are very effective at dismantling uh, federal agencies. They're very effective at dismantling regulation. They're very effective at sidestepping the legislative branch and, and hyper-focusing on court packing, uh, which they've done so well, including all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, and, and utilizing state legislatures that are gerrymandered. So even if you have uh, uh, a... a 10 point difference uh, like in a state of Wisconsin uh, Republicans will still maintain state super majorities at the state legislature they've completely changed uh, slowly but surely through many many years the entire system uh, and it's easy for them to do so because their ideology aligns perfectly with capitalism it's much easier to starve the beast and it's much easier to take a anti-government approach uh, when when uh, that approach also is is fundamentally positive for uh, the corporate bottom line. Deregulation is great for corporations. It improves profit margins. Um, so that's why they're very successful. And that's why uh, they have to find different issues that they can hyper-focus on so that they can continue mobilizing their base of voters. When you say the Democratic Party is feckless, do you see that as a question of like the individual people at the head of it or something more structural? I mean, structurally, yes, absolutely. I think that uh, I think that the people are just uh, the Democratic Party's like leadership is uh, yes they're they're cowards uh, but also um, I guess they're just operating on their own uh, you know on their own interests they're not they're not actually uh, I, I don't think they're motivated by empathy in the way that they present themselves there are a lot of NGOs that might uh, you know or there are a lot of uh, you know great people working in activist circles and whatnot but ultimately I think the Democratic Party itself is not operating out of a place of consciousness or, or being uh, considerate to to marginalized people. I think it's just that's their position. To That's the song and dance that they play. And this bears itself out in the lack of momentum that they put behind actual legislation. When it comes down to it, um, you know, Obama had a, a filibuster-proof uh, Supreme Court. I mean, not Supreme Court, sorry. Obama had a filibuster-proof Senate, and he didn't codify Roe v. Wade. Uh, throughout the past 50 years, the Democratic Party had, I think, 11 or 12 instances where they had a, a supermajority where they could have actually codified Roe v. Wade, and that was out of the question. That's, it's, that, that, I think, is, is a, you know, that's a... On the, on the layers of that, when in, like, the 2009 supermajority, or the 2009, when they had the filibuster, they had 
that wasn't 60 Democrats who would vote to uh, codify Roe v. Wade. Though. I mean, it was a different party back then. Like 12 years ago, it, it was a way different party on social issues. Uh, I, I don't disagree with you, uh, but I do think that uh, but I do think that that is built into the Democratic Party's uh, that's built into the Democratic Party is that there's always going to be a rotating villain. There's going to be a Joe Lieberman or there's going to be someone else who is a spoiler. Uh, if it wasn't for Joe Manchin now or Kristen Sinema now, it would be Maggie Hassan or numerous other senators or even, I think, uh, a group of, of uh, centrist uh, uh, congresspersons could actually build a coalition and uh, dismantle the uh, build a coalition and basically dismantle whatever legislative agenda item that the Democratic Party has that Obama ran on. Um, so I, I do see that, but I think the lack of opposition to internal uh, disagreements and, and and not properly whipping votes in favor of your legislative agenda uh, is because uh, the Democrats are comfortable playing the role of uh, playing the role of like people who are safeguarding our institutions and defending against the the you know accelerationist fascist Republican Party. Um, they just sit back and and take the wedge issues as a gift delivered to them and i think the roe v wade example is perfect for that uh their their failure over the course of the past 50 years is coming back in a way where they can use that now to try to mobilize their base in the midterms when joe biden is deeply unpopular in the country do you see a tension you know when you talk about um the the two-party system and and the, like the huge overlap between the parties i i hear the nuance do you worry that what some people hear is like, well, it's all the same. Don't vote. It's hopeless. Who gives a shit? Um, I'm sure that uh, regardless of what I have to say, that the, you know, the plurality of voters or voter eligible, uh, the plurality of voter eligible population already feels that way. Now, what we have to ask ourselves is, is, it, is Hassan Piker, a Twitch streamer who gained a little bit of a fraction of prominence over the course of the past couple of years, responsible in any meaningful capacity uh, with the the uh, voter base not being interested in voting for either party, or do we think that it's uh, you know nearly a, a decades and decades of ineptitude from the Democratic Party and decades and decades of uh, horrible uh, agenda items from the Republican Party that effectively dismantles the state and harms marginalized people that is pushing the working poor away from voting because they feel as though neither party represents their interests at all, and in a lot of instances they don't even have the time to vote. That is also by design, as you uh, know. You know, it's just not even that easy to vote in many uh, circumstances. You might be a felon, uh, and uh, like in the state of Florida, you might actually have the entire state pretty much uh, by wider margins agree that you should be able to vote. And then Ron DeSantis can come in, uh, even though he defeated his, uh, uh, even though he defeated his competition by like a very slim margin, he can effectively say the 1.5 million. Uh, ex-cons that now are eligible to vote because that's how democracy works uh, will still not be able to vote and will subject them to a poll tax. All of those things happen. If this is an issue you're familiar with, it's one to read up on. Uh, sorry, just talking to the people. It's, it's a couple years ago, it seems this like really hopeful thing, this moment where Florida got together and decided that a felony did not, should not disenfranchise you from democracy. There was, there was a lot of hope around it. It was seen as like a model for going forward. And in the years since, it's just been rolled back repeatedly in, in the most like sinister of ways that has more than like a, a slight resemblance to things that were done in the Deep South, you know, in, in Reconstruction and then again during the Civil Rights Movement. Absolutely. Uh, but the, to go back to the, the earlier question, of course, of course, one Twitch streamer, popular though he is, is not responsible for the vast majority of people sitting out. Yeah. But we only have... We only have the lives we have. We only have the window we have. And within the window that you have, how do you walk that line between pointing out similarities between the parties without giving the impression that uh, th that not voting, that, there, that there's not a substantive difference between sitting out an election and voting in one? Well, I mean, my community does not sit out elections. I, I literally door knocked for Bernie Sanders, urged people, uh, and, and used our gigantic Discord server to continue uh, getting people to go out and, you know, engage in get out the vote initiatives, because ultimately I, you know, 
as much as I hate to admit this, I guess I don't. But, I mean, Noam Chomsky is correct that it's, it is still the harm reduction position to still vote for the Democratic Party. But that's not going to stop me from, uh, you know, uh, openly stating that, like, they are not doing a good job. You know what I mean? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't and argue that. I think that, that if the Democratic Party wanted uh, people to be engaged and enter, uh, engaged in, like, genuinely enthusiastic about getting out to vote for them, they would actually at least do something. Like they would do something that makes them feel, makes the, the voter base feel protected, makes the voter base feel like the Democratic Party's got their back when they don't do that. And they allow spoilers within their ranks to destroy their legislative agenda. And then they hyper focus their initiative and efforts on like actually popular, maybe they're in safe blue districts, but still very popular uh, progressive voices within the party. Like Kirsten Cinema got an incredible W uh, in that bipartisan infrastructure bill as a green senator, right? She's new. Why did she get that? And then she still turned around and used that prominence that the Democratic Party gave her to destroy uh, Joe Biden's agenda. The, the actual Build Back Better agenda was effectively dismantled by Kirsten Cinema and, and Joe Manchin, the two people that the Democratic Party foolishly offered uh, these, these, this incredible benefit of like putting their name on, a, on, on legislature that, that passed through Congress. Yeah, I don't think in, in Trump's Republican Party, someone who bucked Trump's main position wouldn't get the top ranking committee seat on the issue in question. But Joe Manchin is the chairman of the Energy Committee. Oh, yeah. Joe Manchin should be uh, Joe Manchin should be should be sitting on a chair, but I don't know what kind of chair uh, we're talking about. Um, I'll just say this much. OK, I'll just say this. I'm not going to say anything that is going to compromise your position as uh, at, at Rolling Stones. But all all I'll say is this. OK. When Madison Cawthorn came out and said, like, to, to impress some, you know, uh, warrior poet society podcast host that uh, that he uh, was invited to cocaine orgies or whatever, Kevin McCarthy pulled him aside and may or may not have beat the shit out of him. OK, he looked like he got beaten. Uh, he was crying so hard that his face was swollen and red when he got out of Kevin McCarthy's room. Then the Republican Party immediately primaried him, like immediately certainly there was some never trump republicans in that pack that was attacking madison cawthorn but they very quickly punished him okay even before that they very quickly reprimanded him and punished him for even saying such a thing you never see this same level of engagement from the democratic party when it comes down to whipping votes you don't see it when it comes down to um to dismantling um bullshit hurdles that they themselves uh, uh abide by like the senate parliamentarian deciding that the 15 dollar minimum wage cannot be in the in the budget reconciliation uh yeah except you know time and time again the republican party has effectively <laughs> overrode the, the senate parliamentarian when it suits their agenda they did that back in the day uh time and time again they even went so far as to fire a senate parliamentarian and put one in a position put uh, a new senate parliamentarian that complied with the wishes of the republican party democrats never do this now at a certain point you have to stop and think Perhaps the Democratic Party isn't doing this because it's not in their best interest to do this. Perhaps the Democratic Party isn't, uh, you know, genuinely interested in pushing for a $15 minimum wage. Perhaps they're not interested in genuinely codifying Roe v. Wade because they also see it as a good political tool to to mobilize their base. Um, but I think that demonstrably, while there are more Democrats in this country, and demonstrably, while there are more incredibly progressive opinions, if you pick apart those wedge issues and look at the popular support for them, you would recognize that, you know, these are issues that most Americans agree on. Um, the Democratic Party keeps uh, somehow losing elections. How is that even possible? Maybe it's because of the apathy that, uh, uh, that people feel when they see time and time again uh, a bunch of millionaires caping for billionaires and corporations in this country and refusing to do even a, a crumb to actually defend their voter base beyond simply like Walmart or uh, like Nike or all these other companies throw up a fist and say Black Lives Matter and then refuse to push for any kind of initiative that uh, the streets demand or demanded rather. Um, a great example of this was when Donald Trump was in power, obviously, the the, when the George Floyd protests were happening, the Democratic Party said uh, their, their first I an immediate reaction to the defund the police movement, which, of course, none of not a single Democrat is going to go out and like go out the bat and say it. Right. Because it was unpopular uh, in the media um, because no one really understood it or defended it. Um, what did they do? They they 
immediately found uh, a, a much more sanitized, um, policy-driven counter to that. They came to the table with concessions to the, uh, uh, to the opposing party. They, they wanted to push for eight can't wait. That was their initiative, right? We can't take money away from police budgets that are inflated and, and never, uh, uh, never ending and expanding year over year and then put it into you know, some social safety nets or put it into uh, to, to, you know, hiring um, actual counselors or whatnot. You know what I mean? People that are social workers that would actually deal with like half the things that cops shouldn't be dealing with. Um, instead of doing that, they were like, no, we're just going to push for federal legislation or things that already exist, like a, like a choke ban. That was one of the things uh, in 8 Can't Wait. When Democrats actually came to a position of power, what did they do? They ran on police. Uh, they basically ran on funding the police more, but also reforming the police, which is something that they've been saying for many, many years. And then immediately, 8 Can't Wait didn't even pass. They didn't have the votes for it. They didn't whip hard enough for those votes. Um, so... Like I said, I mean, we, they just don't, like the, the Republican Party would never let go of, of real, genuine momentum happening in their base. They do it for their 30% evangelical support. That's why Roe v. Wade is, is you know, done. Um, and and they'll, they'll, they'll do whatever it takes to push for uh, legislation that is in their agenda, no matter how cruel and unjustifiable said uh legislative agenda item is because they're like they're ride or die they're they're ride or die for their base we were talking about this earlier do you um i mean you got takes you got ideas you clearly have convictions do you ever think about running what would it take what would it take to get you to run i would never run never ever no 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 shot Why uh, not? i mean because well first of all i i am uh an imperfect vessel. Uh, I can urge other people to do so, but I myself, I would be a terrible candidate. I, I'm hot-headed. I speak out on my convictions too much. And also, uh, my most famous moments are saying things like, America deserved 9-11, uh, and numerous other things that would immediately... Uh, like, There's so much to use against me in opposition research by literally taking clips out of context. You could just like destroy me. I'm not popular enough to overcome that. Uh, nor would I ever be able to get a base of support uh, to give enough money and enough uh, good-natured coverage in the media to, to overcome that, because I would be effectively primarying a, a um, you know, probably like a blue dog Democrat or something, and the Democratic Party would destroy me. The establishment Democrats would come after me and, and you know, because push you brought my it skull up. in. Because you brought it up. Do you regret saying that about 9-11? No. Do you want to explain... For for an audience that is meeting you for the first time, yeah. you want to explain? You um, said it was a nuance. What are those? I mean, ones? I feel incredibly vindicated for uh, uh for for obvious reasons, considering that in the twentieth anniversary of nine eleven, every single thing that I was talking about when I said what I said uh was was made into documentaries basically, or people were working on those documentaries for years, I guess. But all those documentaries that came out after nine eleven was like, yeah, oh yeah, we kind of did do this to ourselves, which is precisely what my point was. It's it's uh, it's the backlash or the blowback, rather, if you want to use the real term for it, uh, of, of our meddling in uh, in the affairs of the Middle East for uh, for half a century. And it's true. Like, I mean, this is not even something that people discuss in academia. What's up? I mean, you understand how that, like there were there were kids in those buildings. Like, surely they didn't deserve it. No, of course not. But that was never my position. I don't believe the Americans that died on 9-11 deserve to die. Of course not. What I was simply talking about is American foreign policy and, and also, you know, lack of intra-agency communication, the fact that, you know, assets that we knew of and were monitoring uh, were, you know, literally planning this under the noses uh, of the CIA and FBI. Uh, all of that paired up with, you know, half a century of meddling and, and, literally propping up the same people that ended up uh, striking the towers uh, is, is, you know, it's, it's our fault. It's the American government's fault. Yeah, I think when you, when you frame it that way, there's, like a, there's a discussion we had, and there's, there's like a, a compelling reasons. Do you worry about getting just captured in sound bites? I mean, I, I think it's going to happen no matter what. People that don't want to see 
uh, what I am actually saying or people that don't want to be charitable to what I have to say are not going to be charitable. They're going to use everything they can to disparage me. And they do, but ultimately I'm live for 10 hours a day. It's, it's pretty hard to, if you, if you do care, if you do legitimately want to um, hear what I have to say, it's, you know, it's not that hard. You can, you can reach me, you know, I'm, and I will talk about it endlessly, about things I believe in endlessly. All right. Uh, I don't want Ian to miss his train. We're creeping up on time, but uh, last few questions. Uh, do you do you have a dream guest, someone you'd love to have on who you haven't had yet? Um, yeah. Dua, Dua Lipa. That's my dream <laughs> guest. How, uh, how's that going? It's not going well. I keep well, DMing I her. I'm like, Dua, please come on my stream. I love you. And she just does not respond. She's ghosting. We'll hit her. We have some connections. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, all joking aside, no, I do, I do, uh, I, I love that um, she puts herself out there when it comes to um, speaking out about uh, political positions that she holds that the majority certainly uh, is not too fond of, and I, I, re I really respect that. I love when, um, when rich people basically put their wealth on the line, or their, their, uh, you know, famous people put their. Uh, you know, charitability, I guess, on the line uh, to to speak out for marginalized people that otherwise would never be heard. Um, and in like in ten years, if if your life is going well, what do you see yourself doing? Um, I mean, I love doing this. I love streaming. Um, so people always are like, "Oh, what else is next? What's next for you? What do you want to do? Do you want to get?" You know, do, do you want to get it like a mainstream media contract or something like I've had opportunities to to move over to mainstream media, um, but I, I don't like that. I like this. So 10 years down the line, uh, what do I see myself doing? Probably this, hopefully at a much, much larger scale. Uh, you know, I would like to have I would like to be able to do what I'm doing right now to one million people in at the same time rather than the 30,000 or 200,000 when it's, uh, you know, the election uh, when it's election coverage time. Well, if that's, uh, if that's still going on, hopefully 10 years from now, uh, we can have you back. <laughs> All right. Don't wait Not for 10 years. You know, you can, you can have me on before that. <laughs> yeah. I really, uh, I really appreciate all the time you take and the, the thought you put in these answers. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for asking me to come on. This was great. I appreciate you. All right. Well, thanks. Hassan. All right. Bye guys. All right. Bye.